Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Founders Club and the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought. We have a very special program today uh, for you, Locke, Liberty, and Law. This is an interview with Christian Murray, who is the founder and filmmaker of the Founders Club. I'm Randy Oksher. I'm coming to you live from Madrid in Spain, and uh, I want to thank uh, my colleague, Craig Ingstrom, who is handling the technical details for today's program. We're going to be with you for about an hour, and uh, this is being recorded. If you have questions, you will be able to put those uh, in the chat that you're looking at on YouTube or on Facebook, and we'll be able to read them. I certainly welcome uh, uh, you, you all to uh, ask your questions when we come to that time. Uh, I mean, you can ask them before, but they won't be answered until, <laughs> until it's time for that. So um, uh, what I want to do is uh, let you know what's going to happen. First, uh, I'm going to uh, ask Christian a series of questions that he has um, answers that I think you'll find very interesting, and they will follow the form of our title, which is we'll talk about Locke, and then we'll talk about liberty, and then we'll talk about law. Uh, the aim of this program, as with the whole series, which you can see on both the Founders Club YouTube channel and on the AIPCT, the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural, Cultural Thought, uh, our YouTube channel, um, the series of videos that Christian has made during this fall um, for his uh, project, uh, which is really his senior project as a communication studies major at uh, SIU Carbondale. In any case, uh, so we'll we'll go lock, liberty, law, and then it'd be time for your questions and answers. And so I want to begin by saying, uh, Christian, welcome to this was your idea. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the fruition of your idea. The whole project was your idea, and I want to congratulate you on the excellence of these videos and on the project that you've been undertaking independently. Uh, and then uh, later with guidance from the Faculty of Communication Studies at SIU. And uh, so uh, welcome. Uh, be sure to tell us a little bit about yourself as you then tell us uh, a little bit about Locke. How did you come to the project and what is it specifically about Locke that appealed to you? And then if you would tell us some things about Locke from his life and from his thought that are most interesting to you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Oxer. Uh, my name is Christian Murray, and as he stated, I'm the founder of, well, the Founders Club, and I am super duper honored to be here at the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought right here in Murfreesboro. Uh, it really, really is an honor, uh, and I'm this project has been absolutely amazing. The Founders Club, it started a year, a year and a half ago. And uh, kind of the, uh, what it started out was this interest of mine in history and philosophy. And I just wanted to make like simple videos, you know, uh, for kind of people like me and to connect with people through history and philosophy. And then it turned into something bigger and something bigger. And I was like, there's so much more to learn here that is just left out uh, of the public discussion. And so the Founders Club became something more. And uh, we often hear that, you know, those that don't know history are doomed to repeat it. I wanna take things a little bit farther with a quote from Montesquieu, the deterioration of every government begins with the decay of the principles in which they were founded. And that kind of has become, you know, the, the uh, mission of the Founders Club is to prevent that. Uh, the mission of the Founders Club is to actually educate people, is to uh, have this understanding of the framers, of the framers discussion, and also have this understanding of the people that inspired our framers and their discussion. And that's what brings us here uh, to Locke. But right before I get to Locke, I would like to, you know, uh, thank the AIPCT uh, for their partnership in this whole project. It's been absolutely amazing. They've been an amazing resource. Dr. Oxer has been an amazing resource. 
Uh, not only that, but I would like to thank the School of Communication Studies at Southern Illinois University. Uh, this partnership would not actually have been possible without them. And so I'm very thankful for them. Uh, so this whole kind of semester, we've been working on Locke. Uh, why have I found Locke very fascinating? Uh, if you look at the Constitution or you look at, you know, the framers documents, uh, they're trying to protect our liberties. They're trying to protect certain ideas. And where in the world did these ideas come from? Well, we can see this with uh, John Locke. Uh, John Locke has had a very, very enormous impact uh, in, in not only the United States, but on the entire world. Uh, throughout history, we see these figures that are stepping stones. And uh, uh, they, we, they act as stepping stones to get us to where we are. But whenever someone ceases to become a smaller stone, they become bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, they actually become foundational, and that's what Locke is to, you know, the United States system and most systems in the world. They actually, he actually serves as a foundation, and so that is why I've been very interested uh, in John Locke. So, uh, and I guess I kind of need to get into the bio of Locke for us to understand, you know, uh, uh, where Locke came from so we can understand his importance. Uh, so, uh, John Locke, 17th century philosopher, and uh, he had been through a lot. He went through the English Civil War as a young, uh, very young. He didn't really have to participate, but he was able to observe and to observe the horror of that. And uh, he ended up going to school, me meeting uh, Lord Shaftesbury there, who was there looking for a cure to a liver disorder. And he was very much impressed with Locke. Locke was there doing some very impressive things, working with very impressive people such as Robert Hooke, Robert, Robert Boyle, and he asked Locke to be his personal physician. And so uh, Locke ended up uh, going on this journey with Lord Shaftesbury, and that's where he was able to do most of his work and a lot of work that we actually know him for. Uh, and so that, I think, is a good setup to, you know, uh, Locke, and uh, I, I think we can get into a lot of his ideas and uh, a lot of what makes him important in, in the uh, next discussions. Thank you, Christian. Yes. Yeah, so during that time, Locke spent some time in Holland. He spent some time in France. He saw how other people lived in Germany. Um, and he yep. began to understand yep. that uh, the English system could be improved uh, uh, if it uh, were a constitutional monarchy. Right. And so that led to an awful lot of his ideas about freedom, uh, about liberty. And some of those were incredibly important to the development, the later development of the English monarchy, the British monarchy as a, as a whole. And some of them were particularly important for the framing of the American Republic. And so uh, perhaps uh, you'd want to talk a little bit about his effect on both Great Britain uh, and on um, uh, the, the early uh, uh, efforts to frame the Republic uh, in the United States. Well, it wasn't yeah. the United States yeah. yet. And that's the whole point. It was becoming the United States, right? Yeah, I would love to. And so looking at how he inspired, you know, the English along with uh, of course, what would become the United States or the colonies. Uh, so we can see this in a few different ways. First, you know, his essay uh, concerning toleration. During this time period, there had been a lot of discussion about, you know, uh, religion. <laughs> Henry VIII kind of made that happen uh, by breaking away from the Catholic Church at the time. And he uh, actually established, you know, the Church of England. And so there's all this, you know, discussion about religion, uh, and uh, state-run religion or free religion. So he actually creates this uh, essay of toleration. And uh, he puts forth, you know, three main points. First, that uh, earthly judges, you know, can't be 100% uh, in their evaluations of truth claims. Uh, second, you know, you can't fully enforce a religion, even if it is the true religion. And uh, third, uh, of course, if you, if you try to, um, if, if you try to force religion, it's actually going to have more societal breakdown than actually uh, accepting diversity. And so this actually had a pretty uh, big impact on the, at the time of, you know, religious views, religious ideas, and, and it kind of pushed things away from more of like a state run thing, which obviously had a big impact on the declaration as well as the constitution. And it made the English system very, very unique. Um, also, he helped, uh, he wrote an essay concerning human understanding. 
And with that, he puts forth this idea of empiricism uh, and uh, empiricism. It's, it's addressing uh, the idea of skepticism and rationalism. And uh, it's basically saying how our experiences, our senses are a more reliable, you know, form of knowledge than, um, than uh, uh, innate ideas, ideas or just uh, us reasoning. Uh, so why are these things important? Why is toleration? Why is, you know, uh, this this essay concerning human understanding important to, you know, both? Well, it actually pushes it pushed uh, forth this age of enlightenment, this age of thinking. And these all inspired the framers, as well as a lot of English, French, uh, whatever else thinkers to actually write their own work that would actually be, um, you know, that would actually be uh, uh, foundational to his system. Uh, not only that, but uh, he then puts forth this idea of his two treatises of government, and that is what we're actually going to be covering here, uh, mainly with the Declaration as well as the English system. Uh, in England, something had occurred, something very, very special, and it was the Glorious Revolution. The Glorious Revolution was where you know John II was taken out of power and replaced, replaced with uh, William of Orange, and this was not a monarchy becoming another monarchy. It was a totally shift of power where parliament, the people, actually gained more power than the king. Uh, absolute monarchy was on its way out, thankfully due to Locke, which, you know, we will get to. And uh, Locke was able to uh, 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 inspire the people with his two treatises of government. Within his two treatises of government, the first treatise is a whole theological uh, discussion. Uh, the first theological, the first treatise, it's... Uh, it's taking down the divine right of king argument. So there is this whole idea that God has uh, appointed a king and they are going to rule over people, rule over all of you know mankind. And they get this authority by being a child of Adam in a way, a part of Adam's lineage. And this is very silly for us today, but a lot of people actually agreed with this. A lot of people actually believed in this. So uh, Locke helped to dismantle that idea. He helped to show how silly it was. A and so a lot of people did see how silly it was. There is no way this king was an actual, you know, a part of the lineage of Adam. Actually, we all are. Uh, that's what Locke is saying, that there is not just one Adam with power, but in a way, we're all Adams. We all have uh, power. And that's what brings us to uh, the second treatise of government. After knocking down the worldview at the time, he was able to, like, rebuild it into, you know, his idea, his argument, and he's taking from Genesis. In the second treatise of government, he puts forth this idea that we're all atoms, that we all have something called natural rights. We all have life, liberty, and property. And within that life, liberty, and property uh, uh, that God has given us, uh, of course, we shouldn't try to take that away from people, uh, but they're not always defendable in something that Locke called the state of nature. Now, the Garden of Eden, uh, the before government, existed this is what we would know as uh the state of nature and so uh there we have life liberty and property but that's not always defendable in the state of nature so something has to be done we have to do something in order to protect our lives our liberties and our well properties and so something that uh, that had to be done was government had to be instituted and so the people come together to form a contract to form a social contract to form a government to form what what called a civil society. And this civil society, the main purpose of this civil society is to protect uh, the, the lives, the liberties, and the properties of the people. Now, when that, act, when that government fails to do that, it fails in its main purpose. And since it fails in its main purpose, it is no longer legitimate. And because it's no longer legitimate, you have a right to revolution. And this is why Locke was saying, you know, he was using this, to defend his glorious revolution. And the framers saw this. And when the framers actually saw this, uh, uh, they needed a way to, um, to explain to the world why in the world, you know, they're separating, uh, why in the world they're wanting to declare independence. And they're wanting to give reasons. And so what better reasons to give than what Locke used in their revolution? And this brings us to the Declaration of Independence. So whenever Jefferson sat down, he already had to write down the Declaration of Independence. He already had a framework uh, to work from, which was Locke. Uh, so if we can't go to uh, his ideas, we can show 
in the Declaration of Independence, we can show how valuable Locke is here. Uh, can we blow that up on the screen, uh, full screen? Okay, so on the right side, we have you know Locke's uh, ideas, and on the left, we have what Thomas Jefferson has taken. And so obviously, uh, Locke states, you know, the state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges everyone, and reason, which is that law teaches all mankind who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his health, liberty, or possessions. Uh, and this is what, you know, th this is kind of the, the uh, purpose statement here. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident and what uh, Jefferson originally called sacred and un undeniable, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so with these ideas, it's, you know, men are all equal. And this, you know, is, is why meant for government is to protect these natural rights, life, liberty, and what Watt called property and what Jefferson calls pursuit of happiness. Uh, next slide. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, there's this big idea. What if a government, you know, is doing some bad things or what if a government has its issues? And this is kind of the big purpose uh, or this is a, a I think enormous point within the Declaration of Independence. Both of these basically say that, you know, governments should not, you know, be destroyed with every mismanagement or every uh, issue. Uh, Jefferson states, governments long established should not be changed for the light and transient causes. And according, uh, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. And so, the whole thing here is we shouldn't throw off government with every little issue with problems and, and such. What, re what is required is an actual train of abuses or usurpations. And that is what Locke also says, but a long series, uh, series of abuses, abuses, lies, tricks, all of these things, just a long list of issues. And of course, whenever these long problems happen, whenever these long issues, these long abuses happen, um, what is required is to remove that government and to create a new government to guard their future. And so with the Declaration of Independence here, it's, it's a direct mirror. Uh, next slide. <laughs> now, of course, uh, what are some of these problems that Locke sees with the government? Or what is the, what is the issues that Jefferson is, po Jefferson is pointing out against the British government? Um, obviously, they're talking about taxation without representation. Uh, there should be taxation with representation, and that is one of the biggest claims that Jefferson, you know, points uh, at the king. He, he's basically saying, you know, uh, he, uh, he has taxed us without representation. He has imposed taxes on us without our consent, which is a big no-no to Locke. It's a big no-no to Jefferson. Not only that, but the government, whenever they're actually not protecting the people, not defending their lives, their liberties— uh, or, or, you know, uh, any, their natural rights, that government is no longer legitimate. And that is what the government in Britain was doing. They were uh, basically not protecting the people. They were not only not protecting the people, but they were harming the people. They're plundering our seas. They're ravaging our uh, coast. They're burning our towns. And so this government that's supposed to protect us isn't actually protecting us. It's harming us. And that is what Locke is saying, you know, someone who uses force against the people without authority and contrary to the trust they had given him, which is the government, puts himself into a state of war, you know, with the people. Uh, and, and so here's Jefferson saying, hey, look at these, look at all the stuff that the king is doing. It's exactly what Locke says. Uh, next slide. And uh, we're about to be done with this section. So um, obviously with uh Locke, he states that no exercise of force of government counts as hostile if it leaves open the possibil uh, possibility of such an appeal. And this is something that the framers really adhered to. They did not want to separate. They wanted to, like, stay Englishmen. They wanted their English rights, but the king just ignored them. And this is why they say in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for the redress of the most humble terms. Our, uh, our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injuries. And so that is what Locke is even saying here. It is only when a force closes that door that it puts the user of it into the state of war. And so here you have the king, you have the monarchy, you have the government attacking its own people, ignoring their cries, 
And by doing all that, he is putting himself into a state of war against its people. And when a state of war happens, you need to throw them off. Next slide, please. And this is kind of another big portion. You can't just throw off a government. Uh, and you have, to, you have to make sure that you're justified in overthrowing a government. Uh, this is why Locke says, you know, it is wrong to use force against anything except unjust and unlawful force. Whoever opposes a government for any other reason draws on himself a just condemnation from both God and man. And that is why Jefferson states, we, therefore, the representative of the United States of America, uh, in the General Congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. Here he is appealing to God. And he, he also says the history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations. And, and he is saying, look, they have done this over and over and over, and we are appealing to God. And we are appealing to heaven. Uh, and not only do they have to appeal to God, but they also, this is not just a sin against God, it's a sin against man. And so they have to, you know, showcase this to the entire world, show to the entire world why they're declaring independence, justify themselves, not only to God, not only to justify an appeal to heaven, but to justify and appeal themselves to mankind as well. Uh, blow up the side just a little bit bigger again, one more time, uh, back, back one more, there we go. Uh, and this is why they say, you know, to prove these things, let us let facts be submitted to a, a candid world. And then also says a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separ uh, to the separation. And so here they they are. They're appealing not only to God, to the people. And I've also included a flag here and appeal to heaven. This is a revolutionary flag that was flown. And it's saying, hey, we're not just a random revolution here. Uh, we're not just randomly doing this. There's been a long series of issues with this government. They're attacking our natural rights, taking our natural rights away, taking our civil rights away. And so in order to, you know, right these wrongs, we have to revolt. And it's not unjustified. It's justified because of God. It's justified because, well, we're appealing to heaven. And hopefully, you know, uh, hopefully we're on the right side. And Locke even says that, like, pray that you're on the right side here. Um, and, of course, they're submitting this to the world as well. And so uh, with the Declaration of Independence, it's literally a mirror of Locke's work. It's a mirror of Locke's belief systems. And they're using Locke to, in a way, justify their revolution. And uh, this brings us to the Constitution, I, I believe. Things that I would add in clarification is that uh, the argument of the De Declaration of Independence was not that the people of the colonies were declaring war on Great Britain or on the king, but rather that a state of war already existed as a result of uh, the king's action and some of the actions of Parliament. As you know, there were defenders of the colonies in Parliament as well. So it's not a simple or a monolithic thing, and that's part of the reason why an appeal to heaven would be necessary is because um, uh, uh, Locke understood in his day when he's arguing for the constitutional monarchy uh, that human wisdom is limited and certainly Jefferson understood as he was following Locke's lead that um, it was difficult to be certain whether in the eyes of heaven they were doing the right thing but they took themselves to be doing it and uh, place themselves before the judge of the, the supreme judge of the earth uh, for that. And so one of the things that I really enjoyed about studying um, the, the second treatise and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the effect on the framers with you was, was discovering, because I read a bunch about Locke that I had never read before, was discovering how much the legitimacy of a revolution dep depends on the appeal to heaven. Um, uh, since it exceeds human wisdom to know for certain whether a state of war genuinely exists or whether we're still in a situation where all the sides are acting within their, within their legitimate purview and their legitimate authority. It's very difficult to tell the difference sometimes. Um, and so uh, this led people like Thomas Hobbes to criticize Locke uh, saying, well, the only way you're ever sure going to be certain about uh, who who's right in the eyes of heaven is to look to see who wins 
Um, and it's a cynical view. If you win, you must have been right. And if you lose, you must have been wrong. This was the criticism that they um, put toward Locke. And part of the reason that that criticism had some teeth, part of the reason that it was an important criticism uh, was because it turns out that this relationship between liberty, which is being defended, and law, which is the thing that governs liberty and limits it, that is a very difficult relationship to govern. It's a very difficult relationship to know in specific cases or even in general uh, what the relationship between liberty and law is. As the framers themselves discovered within a few years of having um, uh, framed their own liberty, they then had to frame their own law. So why don't you go on and talk a little bit about Locke's influence over the subsequent formation of the Republic and the Constitution of the United States. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing that uh, is, is pretty amazing about, uh, about Locke. I mean, if you look at the, the United States Constitution, uh, we can look at the preamble. Uh, I believe we have a, the preamble uh, for, for uh, the viewers on one of the slides uh, on the next one. So you know what the what the what the preamble is basically it's it's doing here it, it's it's giving this like purpose statement and this is this is locked this is you know what in the world is this constitution designed for what in this what in the world is this constitution even going to do and what they say you know we the people of the United States and that right there Locke is saying that the sovereign is the people it's the people that come into contract with each other that they, they form this social contract you know, to form a government in order to do certain things to protect our natural rights. And that's what they're going to be discussing here. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, to form this civil society, as Locke would say. And, and that's the problem with the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation, the, uh, the Constitution that came before the Constitution that we're living under, it did not do this well. Uh, there's a bunch of divisions. And, and so this is a big jab at the Articles of Confederation, the failure of that government uh, to form a more perfect union, establish justice, establish justice, uh, to have an indifferent judge. This is a big part of having governments to settle disputes against you know, citizens, against people, uh, uh, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. All of these things are very Lockean. These are the general welfare, especially. Uh, before there was absolute right, uh, there's absolute right of kings. There was the divine right of kings. There's absolute monarchies. These things, they could care less about the people. It's about the monarchy and, and it's not really about the general welfare. Uh, it doesn't matter how strict, how bad the king can be uh, in the divine rights argument. He's uh, destined to be king by God. Uh, he has given this authority from God. A and of course, uh, with uh, then you have Thomas Hobbes, like Dr. Oxford mentioned, and he has this like, he, he removes a lot of the biblical framework and he doesn't support a divine right of kings. He just says, hey, it works. It's practical. It doesn't matter how much authority the, the king has. Uh, it, 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 they can have supreme authority, absolute authority. And uh, you can't expect too much from a king, you know, they'll hurt you, they'll take your rights, so what? Um, okay, back to, the, uh, back to the slide really quick. Okay, so promote the general wel welfare. This is promoting the welfare of the people. That is what governments are there to do. And secure the blessings of liberty, which is obviously, you know, that's our natural rights, our lives, the blessings that's from God, you know, of liberty. Uh, our, our lives, our liberties, our properties, our pursuit of happinesses uh, to ourselves and our posterity. That's another big thing with Locke. He not only says that, hey, governments not are, are not only instituted by us, but our, our posterity, they're going to be living under this government. They're actually going to be receiving the benefits from our government. And so they're also agreeing to this, you know, contract. So uh, that's what we've been doing for the last 200 years. Uh, 200 years, over 200 years, we've been uh, a recipient of, of uh, our government, of, of you know, the, the blessings of liberty there. Uh, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. And that's the thing that Locke does. Locke does, he not only brings this idea of, you know, giving people the power, but he is a constitutionalist. 
He is about the government serving the people, not the people serving the government. And, and that is what the founders wanted. The founders wanted the government to actually serve the people. Uh, they, they saw the issues within the, the British monarchy. They saw the issues within, you know, all of human history, and they wanted to try to avoid, uh, avoid those issues. So they created a government with checks and balances in order to protect Locke's idea, which is, you know, for the people to rule, for the people to have the power and, and to have the say so and to have the sovereignty. All right. I appreciate that. Now, of course, that's the preamble to the Constitution. I note that it says that they're going to ordain as well as establish the Constitution. And um, uh, in this case, that means that they're taking uh, upon themselves uh, the, uh, the weight of setting it aside for God's blessing. That's what ordination means. It means to set aside uh, for God's special blessing, for God's special uh, oversight. Um, and so one might argue that the uh, relative success of the Constitution, although it has been severely tested many times, the relative success of the Constitution uh, might suggest that it was in fact ordained. Um, I do think that an awful lot of the uh, democracies, the constitutional democracies that exist today um, have attempted to to copy those aspects of our constitution in the U.S. that got things right. Um, and of course, as we know, the process of its amendment is another way to, uh, uh, is another way to look at uh, how it is that something even um, established and, and, and ordained uh, can still be revised as time went on. The framers didn't all agree on what would be necessary in order to maintain the integrity of the Constitution over you know, the history of a republic. But they certainly were optimistic, especially Madison was, that the very size and uh, the differences that we find, uh, the size of the United States and the differences among the people would actually be a source of balance uh, in maintaining the Constitution. All right, so with that said, Christian, I guess we've come to that point when People might ask questions, and you could uh, um, uh, you could offer your answers, and maybe I offer some of mine as well. So, if uh, folks watching want to type their questions in, that would be that would be most welcome. I've seen several comments go by, but uh, um, nobody has asked a direct question yet. I assume it's working. Y'all don't go. be shy. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Y'all don't be shy. There is a comment. There is a um, comment. Um, oh. Oh. Hello, Khalid. He's my friend. <laughs> so, what do you think, Christian? Oh, okay. No uh, sorry. No, I got to no get a little closer. So Locke said no religion could be 100% enforced. How he differentiated English law of his times from Christianity. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, it's not just, uh, okay. So it's not just, we, we have to have an understanding of this time period. Obviously, uh, most, most people at this time were uh, Christian and under the Christian influence. Uh, whenever we talk about a lot of different religious, uh, uh, diverse, whenever we talk about religious diversity and uh, those kind of things, we're not just talking about, you know, a big, big broad sense of like all religions. Uh, we're, we're discussing, you know, different branches of Christianity, different, uh, different, uh, uh, not just branches of Christianity, but, you know, you have Catholicism, you have the Protestant, you know, uh, Reformation that came through and you have all these different, you know, uh, different branches of Protest uh, Protestant. I can't talk now. Sorry, my connection connections messing up. There we go. Uh, we have we have the different branches of the Protestant movement, and so uh, of course their values 
everything on English law is going to stem from that, that Christian framework, especially in English during this time and on English law. And so those things are more seen, I, I would say, uh, coming from Locke and coming from, you know, others as kind of a given. And, and you have to work within that frame. What, what Locke sees is you work within that framework. His whole two treatises of government, it's a very, very, uh, it's a very theological, philosophical, those are philosophical, theological pieces. And so uh, Locke is, is using Genesis. He's using, you know, Christianity uh, to, to, uh, sorry, I was looking at questions, uh, build up his idea of government, to build up his natural rights. And, and so within that, you know, you do have toleration, you do have freedoms, but a lot of it is built on this, like more of a, of, uh, a Christian values framework. So, and his so, idea of the state of nature is very, of nature. Uh, it is Genesis. Um, I, I would add to that, uh, that uh, Locke, when he was young, his idea of religious diversity was uh, the Church of England plus the handful of Protestant uh, um, movements that opposed the Church of England. He was pretty anti-Catholic uh, when he was young, but he traveled uh, and he lived in a part of uh, what would now be called Holland, uh, not far from uh, France. And he saw Catholics and Protestants of several different uh, denominations, as well as Jews, living together quite peacefully and quite respectfully. And it caused him to change his view, uh, Khalid. Uh, and the longer he lived, the more, he, the more of a religious pluralist he became. Of course, he had to leave England and live um, uh, with the Dutch for some years as a result of uh, political difficulties, and so that gave him uh, even more reason to study the tolerant Dutch, as they are uh, often called. And so, with the tolerant Dutch uh, in mind, the question might be, well, where would Locke stand on things like uh, the Muslims and the Buddhists and other kinds of religions? And I think it's reasonable to think that Locke would have extended his pluralism that far. He didn't know much about other religions than Christianity, except for Judaism, which he had some limited experience with uh, and had very positive things to say as he matured about how it is that Jews ought not be uh, forced to live in any way that's against their own religious consciences. At the time that he lived, there was war in Spain between the Muslims uh, and the Catholics in Spain, and he was well aware of these conflicts. He did not express any negative views about the religious nature of those uh, conflicts, but rather tended to see them as political conflicts rather than as religious conflicts. And so in terms of explicit statements about the Muslim religion, I can't remember reading anything explicit about it, but I think that his general views of toleration, particularly as it applied to the Jews, would probably be extended to also to other religions apart from the various sects of Christianity and the Jews. So I think that toleration in general would be, would be Locke's mature position. Yeah. Okay. You didn't mention how Locke owned stock in slave trading companies and was secretary of the Lord Pro proprietors of the Carolinas based on dehumanization and on freedom. Uh, okay. So not only I'll actually add some more here, not only that, but within his second treatise, uh, he does have a whole chapter kind of built on, on uh, the idea of slavery. And obviously these are big issues. These are, you know, uh, we do not agree, you know, especially uh, we do not agree in today's climate or today's world uh, on these things. And there are awful things. And within history, we look at, we look at what ideas are good, you know, what ideas have, you know, put us where we are and uh, what ideas should we actually leave in the past? What are harmful? What have been awful? And uh, this is one of those things. Uh, his whole slavery chapter, uh, totally, you know, disagree. And uh, it, it is clear that, you know, Block was pretty wrong on it. <laughs> and so uh, within his whole first entreatise of government, it's like the guy is very revolutionary. 
hitting, you know, all the right buttons, uh, A, B, C, D. And then, of course, on this slavery issue, uh, big misstep on his part. And uh, this is something that, you know, uh, has been, you know, left behind. And uh, Locke obviously uh, owns, he owns stock in the slave trading companies. And so that's a, that's a failure on Locke. And, uh, and, you know, those ideas, uh, I'm very happy they, they've been left in the past. Uh, I, I'm happy we were inspired by his natural rights, by his life, his liberty, and his, uh, what, what we would now call pursuit of happiness, but his property arguments, his idea on what makes a government legitimate. And uh, a lot of his enlightenment ideas, uh, ironically, actually destroys uh, his slavery points. It contradicts a lot of them. So, and I'll let and Dr. Oxer. You know, yeah, I, I, I want to add a little bit of detail. The, uh, the crucial, obviously, uh, Locke owned uh, stock. Oh. In, um, in Shaftesbury's and the Lord Proprietors um, a Corporation of North Carolina. They were trying a number of experimental ideas there. There's no question that Locke made money from, uh, from the slave trade. That definitely occurred. It's obviously inexcusable. There's a difference, I think, between the arguments that we find in Locke's work and what Locke himself did. Part of the reason is, is that the arguments were all made at a particular time uh, in his development, uh, and he found himself in positions that, I mean, his whole life was a series of surprises to him. If you had told him when he was a medical student that he would one day uh, be writing the economic treatises that governed the, the, the economic policy of all of Great Britain, he wouldn't have believed you, but he did in fact write those treatises for Shaftesbury. And so, um, uh, as things unfolded, I think just like any human being, he adapted to the situation he found himself in, and he was very uh, he was very clear that no human being is going to avoid hypocrisy entirely. I believe he was aware that owning slaves was hypocritical. The problem, the key to this argument, is that he made money uh, and bu buying and selling a part of the state of nature. In other words, m money and the existence of a private property through his doctrine of enclosure was not a part of civil society, but was in fact a part of the natural order. And the most important piece of that for him was that you have your body on loan from God. You don't even own your own body, but you have it on loan. And that's part of the reason you have a, a, a duty to defend it. And when he's talking about slavery, one of the things, one of the questions he asks is whether you can buy and sell your labor. The answer to that question is yes. But then can you then indenture yourself? Can you literally um, make yourself a slave of another person? And he said, not permanently. You couldn't do that permanently um, because to do so would be to forego your capacity to protect your very life. And so it's a limited defense of slavery, more uh, a defense of the right to buy and sell your own labor. And so it's more like a defense of indenture than a, than, than a defense of slavery. Slavery is something that comes about in civil society. Uh, and to, to make a slave of yourself in the, in the state of nature would be to declare war on yourself, and it would be against the will of God. On the other hand, in civil society, he does, uh, let's just say he fudges on that same argument. If he had been consistent in what he said in the state of nature, uh, with then its application to civil society, we would have a lot less to complain about today regarding Locke. However, there are a number of differences, fundamental differences between the state of nature and civil society, and this is only one of the differences that's on that list. So, so insofar as you're, uh, I mean, I don't think Locke can be defended. I'm with Christian on this, but there's something to be understood here in the distinction between civil society, which is often corrupt, and the state of nature, which at least ideally never is. And so uh, that's um, that's 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 all I would have to say. I'm not defending Locke. I'm not defending Locke. <laughs> I guess. Uh, what do you think uh, is the meaning in changing life, liberty, and private property to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Okay, this is actually kind of an interesting one. I think there's a few things that can be said for this change. 
Um, so I'll begin with the first one with, uh, obviously, uh, pursuit of happiness and property. Uh, with Jefferson, Jefferson couldn't fully buy into the whole uh, property idea because, well, of slavery. He owned slaves, and so that's a big issue. Um, and so he couldn't really fully buy into what what uh, what Locke would call property, but he kind of has the idea, I guess, what, what Locke was going for. So it, let's go back to a state of nature and uh, with, with natural rights, life, liberty, and property. And so everything is destined to, to promote life. So you have liberty because if someone you know, takes your liberty, they can also take your life. And you have to have property in order to sustain your life. And, and so God, he breathes life into man. He gives them life. He gives man a choice, liberty. And he gives man the Garden of Eden and tells him to, you know, uh, multiply all over the world. And this is property. And, and so there's this, there's this idea of working the ground to making something yours. And, and this whole system, I, I believe, would, uh, would what Jefferson would say is like the pursuit of happiness. Uh, actually, uh, 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 actually working the ground, making something better than what it was and uh, multiplying it. Uh, and, and so, and, so, uh, so, oh, so, like, so you're saying, you're saying, you're saying that the pursuit of happiness in this sense is a generalization of all of these things that are supposed to be good in life. It yes. includes property. Yes. In other words, so that's what you're saying. Yes, it, it does include property. Well, it, 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 in a way it includes property, but in a way it also kind of undermines it because of the whole, you know, Jefferson having slaves. <laughs> And so it's kind of like this, the, the idea of it, but then it does remove, you know, uh, it undermines property because of the whole slavery issue with Jefferson. So, in other words, you could make the argument that as long as the slaves were allowed to pursue happiness, they didn't need property. Oh, it froze for me. I don't know if you can hear me, but I will be back on the stream in a second because it froze for me. Uh, what I said, Christian, while, while it was frozen for you is, uh, uh, is that you could, uh, you could, I think, say that Jefferson was leaving open the argument that if slaves could pursue happiness, then that was enough. They didn't need property because obviously slaves couldn't have property. Anything they owned technically really belong to their owners right uh and so uh so, so it's uh it's so it's not just a generalization of all the things that are supposed to be good in life it's also a way of slipping out of the natural right to property yeah yeah so this is a good one from um Shum uh i i I uh, apologize for the mispr mispronouncing uh, from uh, mispronouncing your name, but Shamala uh, Khan, how uh, how con how how are the concepts of the state of nature of Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau different? Okay, so um, Locke has a very very idealistic view of human nature of mankind and uh, Locke's human nature, it does, it does look like Genesis. It does look like the Garden of Eden, you know. Uh, men, they're not just forming government. They're not coming together because they're bad, because, you know, uh, they're fearful, not because, you know, uh, some, some big scary guy comes forth and like takes over everything. Uh, people are actually forming government in order to uh, protect their lives, to protect their liberties and their properties, to better, I should say, better protect uh, their lives, their liberties and their properties. They're doing it in order to obey God. In, uh, they're, they're getting into government in order to, uh, for, for very idealistic reasons. And Locke is very idealistic on this. Hobbes, very, very pessimistic. Everything is brutish in the state of nature. Uh, the state of nature is not where Locke would say the state of nature, it's very, it, it's good, but people sin, and so we have problems, and so people kind of need government to solve those problems. He, he almost downplays these problems in a way. Uh, Hobbes, he f puts these problems on full display. He lived through the English Civil War. He saw, you know, the bloody carnage that man is capable of. And so he's just saying man is so bad they're animalistic, they're horrible, and uh, this is the grim, horrible nature of 
the state of nature. And so people have to have civil government. And not only do they have to have civil government, but they have to have something strong to control them. And so we're like, Locke, he doesn't see st the state of nature as like, uh, as brutish. And so we don't need that much government in order to actually correct it. And in order to like protect our life, liberty and property, Hobbes is like human nature. The state of nature is so bad that we have to have absolute authority. We have to have an absolute monarch in order to curb that awfulness. Now with Rousseau, uh, I personally have not read as much Rousseau and I believe Dr. Oxer, uh, can add more here. Uh, state of nature uh people uh people get into like civil society society out of fear uh it's not it, it's a little bit of a compromise between Locke and Hobbes and so with Locke and Hobbes it's not as grim and horrible as Hobbes and it's not as idealistic as Locke it's it's uh pretty realistic but I'll actually let Dr. Oxer uh, discuss more on Rousseau because he actually knows a lot more about Rousseau. Uh, thank you, Christian. Yeah, um, one of the things that is a real difference in Rousseau's way of approaching the problem is that he doesn't think of the state of nature as being anything that ever really existed. His state of nature idea is actually a thought experiment. It's uh, something that we can use in order to separate the aspects of human nature that really come to us in virtue of our animality from the aspects of human nature that come to us as a result of having lived for you know hundreds of generations in civil society generally speaking he sees civil society as having spoiled and warped and distorted human nature and that if you can get if you peel away the layers of civil society and all of the corruption that has been um, handed down over you know hundreds of generations of civil society if you could peel away those layers and actually get through to the true human being who is before you um, when you're looking at a human being what you would have is some someone who actually does know how to take care of himself or herself someone who has no warlike intentions toward anyone else uh, most important someone who is capable of being educated in such a way as to be better than he or she uh, was before but civil society gets in the way of uh, of this 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 nature he Rousseau says that there are really two things that distinguish human beings from the animals uh, one is is our capacity for um, uh, uh, it's our inability to withstand the sight of suffering um, and so uh, our recognition you could call it our compassion uh, the word pity is usually used in the uh, uh, in the translations. And so the thing that really makes us different from other animals is our capacity to feel pity for the suffering of others. Um, and of course, the other one is our reason. Uh, and so we've got the capacity, uh, and by reason, uh, Rousseau means something more like our educability. It's our capacity to, uh, to improve ourselves morally through a process of uh, paying attention to what does and does not work and what is and is not true um, about our experience. And so reason and the power of pity. And so what he does is he sort of boils Hobbes and Locke down to uh, these two things and says, look, we don't really need a historical state of nature. What we need is a way to understand what's basic to human nature and how it's distinguished from animal nature. And so reason and compassion or pity are the two things. And so he builds the social contract out of that and one third and, and a third idea that, that Hobbes and Locke don't have called the general will. But I won't go into that because it's complicated. Okay, and then uh, Ora Reddington says, uh, what is the relevance of these principles that Locke promotes in today's United States political arena? Uh, okay, awesome. I really uh, appreciate this question. So obviously we need to like understand, you know, uh, as, as if you guys have not seen, uh, go check out our series that we've done Locke on the Founders Club and also on the AIP. YouTube channel. You guys can check out uh, our, our 
whole Locke series there and understand a lot of Locke's, you know, uh, theories and his ideas more. Um, and, and so, uh, with these principles that Locke establishes, I believe that we need to understand, you know, why in the world do we not only have government in general, but why in the world do we have like our form of government, our form of representative, uh, representative government? I don't know if I'm frozen. Sorry, my connection's weird. Um, so we can hear so, you. We can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, why in the world do we have these? We need to understand why in the world we have government. And so as, as um, our system is trying to pursue Locke, it's trying to pursue, you know, this idea of government in order to protect our lives, our liberties, and well, uh, what, what uh, Jefferson would call uh, pursuit of happiness, but our properties. And, and so we need to keep that, you know, in sight so we can, like, understand that those principles so they can't be subverted. Um, not only that, but uh, I believe also his essay of, you know, toleration. We do need more toleration and not just toleration, but understanding. I believe, like, within the political arena, not just, like, watching things or not just, you know, hearing about stuff, but actually going out and doing what, you know, his empiricist ideas – actually uh, getting our knowledge from reliable sources, going out into our communities, understanding each other, understanding our neighbors, understanding, you know, uh, if you, if you want to get involved, get involved, but like do it through uh, what, what I believe uh, using his empirical uh, ideas, using his, you know, essay concerning human understanding. Uh, so you don't just, you know, hear random things or you don't just, uh, have ideas and try to reason things out, but actually experience, you know, the world experience, you know, your communities and through those experiences, those experiences will educate everything else. And so I think that's something that has been missing for a long time within, you know, the American or uh, for especially the last few years, the uh, framework is to rely on your experiences and go out and like literally experience um, your communities, your families, your everything around you and develop more actual experience. I would say that is something that we need to apply in the United States principal arena. All right. Thank you, Christian. Um, I uh, uh, appreciate that. Obviously this is a discussion that can go on for quite some time as to how things apply today, but I think we're out of time. Uh, and so I want to encourage everyone to go to the AIPCT uh, YouTube channel and to the Founders Club YouTube channel and hit the like button. Uh, watch all the videos you want to. Uh, there's plenty on both channels, uh, including the overlap of this series on the roots of American philosophical and cultural thought. Uh, and also, uh, there's a, a website for AIPCT, AmericanPhilosophy.net. As you see, it's scrolling past. As I say that, by all means, check that out to see what kind of programming is coming up on the AIPCT. We've got some exciting things coming up uh, uh, in the uh, spring, so uh, keep abreast of that. We've got Facebook pages for both of these. And so you can go to Facebook, like our Facebook page, and that's another way to keep up with what we're doing in Founders Club and what we're doing in uh, AIPCT. So thank you very much, Christian, for your uh, answers and for all your work this fall. And thank you so much, uh, you Dr. So Oxer. Uh, thank you for you know this amazing opportunity, and uh, I look forward to working with you some more. Yes, we're not we're not finished, folks. So there's uh, there there are other there are other videos planned for this series, and I look forward to uh, those uh, working with Christian on those, and they'll show up uh, on the website and the YouTube channels uh, as soon as as soon as they get finished. So thank you all uh, for joining us today, and uh, this uh, we're actually going to be doing more in the future in terms of a live stream and uh, interviews and talks and Q&As about the roots of American political thought. We think this is timely, especially in light of that final question that's being asked. Obviously, obviously it's something that's on everybody's minds, and I think uh, we should talk more about it, and so we will definitely be doing more live streaming and Q&A uh, on the AIPCT and Founders Club. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks to Craig Engstrom for his technical uh, uh, genius in making all of this possible. And so from Madrid and from Carbondale, 
right? Uh, we, uh, we wish you a good day.